Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Many job applicants are are given some kind of test to measure their ability to perform the requirements of the job for which they are applying. Students are given standardized tests throughout their years of schooling, which is used as a, a reference point by their teachers to measure their progress in learning and understanding of the subject material that they are being taught. Professionals in medicine, law, and and various other fields are required to pass rigorous examinations before they are allowed to be licensed for practice in that professional field. If God were to give us a test as Christians, how do you think we would all perform on that test? If God were to make a test of our ability to be his people, to go out into the world and to share with others the power of the resurrection of Jesus and the story of his love, what would our grade on that test be? The disciples of Jesus were put to the test. By themselves, they were incapable and they would have failed every demand or request that God had placed before him. As we read the Gospel books in the Bible, we see how again and again they often showed their human frailty and weakness. By themselves, they would have failed in every instance because neither they nor nor anyone else is equipped by their own power to carry out the test because, as God tells us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As we grow in our Christian faith and our understanding of what God wants us to be and to do in our lives as his followers, We come to realize more and more each day that without his power and grace, we would be total failures. Without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we cannot even begin to live as his people in the way that he wants us to. So what brings about a change for us? What makes it possible for a person to share the gospel of Jesus, to to really be filled with zeal for that mission of sharing the gospel. Certainly, it must be, it can only be God the Holy Spirit who leads people to a new life in Christ by the power of the gospel. The Apostle Paul gives witness to this power when he doesn't follow, uh, fall into the trap of inviting people to follow him and his own personality and his own ideas. No, he made it clear that he was not teaching his own thoughts and opinions as as doctrine. In verse 5 of our reading, he says, We do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, he says, your slaves, literally. This was the message. This was his mission to proclaim Jesus as the Savior and Lord of the whole world, and to serve him by serving other people. So if God would place such a test before us, would we be able to pass? Are we able to say that we are concerned about nothing else except Jesus Christ and the gospel message? Are we ready to proclaim the message of his redeeming love and to live for him totally and fully with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength. Those earliest disciples of Jesus were very human in every way. The Bible indicates this when it says that they were called out of darkness. They were filled with the same fears, same doubts, the same anxieties that are shared by all people, including you and me today. They had the same sets of the same kinds of problems that we have in our lives. Those men that Jesus chose as his disciples had nothing exceptional about them to to qualify them for service as his disciples. They had to be called by him, to be chosen and, and specially selected to have the light of his love shining into the darkness of their sin filled hearts and lives. The Apostle Paul writes that darkness that he describes represents their unbelief, their sin, their fear of death, their selfish self-centeredness. 
In short, as, as we read so often in the Bible, darkness represents everything that is opposed to the light of the truth and love of God. When God shines his light into darkness, then we see the great contrast that exists between the darkness and his light. And it's always that way. Whenever people come into contact with God, the same contrast exists between sin and forgiveness, death and life, selfish living and selfless living. God draws people out of that darkness of sin to himself. God tells us through his Apostle Paul in verse 6 of our reading that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God shines through Jesus. Through Jesus, people find the glory that God wants to share with them. God doesn't want to focus on our sins. No, in Christ. God gives us forgiveness and welcomes us into his family. Instead, in his grace and mercy, instead of of focusing on our sins and bringing us the punishment that we deserve, instead God the Father looks at his son Jesus and in his grace in Jesus, he sees our sins and the sins of the world. And also in his grace, he looks at us, he looks at all the people of the world And instead of our sins, he sees in us the righteousness of his son, Jesus, our Savior. This is the answer. This is what makes people followers of Jesus. This is what equips people for the task of being God's people, of of reflecting the light of his love in the darkness of this sin-filled world. But the Apostle Paul goes on to indicate that followers of Jesus are still troubled with their humanness. In verse 7, Paul tells us that we have God's love, mercy, and grace in clay jars. He's referring to our sinful nature and our imperfection as fallen human beings. We have that, that beautiful, glorious treasure of the gospel, the good news of God's saving love for all mankind through Jesus, his Son. But we are still mortal frail, sinful, flawed human beings. Clay jars. We can do nothing through our own power to change this spiritual situation of ours. But God is the one who initiates the action for change, who takes us wretched, sinful people and remakes us, refashions us into his holy image. Just like a lump of clay in the hands of a potter, God shapes and he molds us for his service. If we're honest with ourselves, we must admit that we are nothing more than fragile, unappealing clay jars. But God wants us. God wants to make use of us as frail and and unappealing as we might be. How is that possible? Of what possible value could we be to God? Just as the the potter shapes his material for a specific use that he has in mind, not every vessel, not every clay jar is meant to hold a, a beautiful rose. God shapes his people for different functions, giving us a, a variety of gifts and talents, but all to be used to his service and for his glory. And he might even use some of our problems and some of our flaws in spite of those things, still making use of us for his purpose. And so in the end, some of us will be just right to hold that that beautiful, delicate rose, and perhaps others suitable to to hold a, a bunch of wild flowers, but each one of us will serve the exact purpose for which God has formed and fashioned us in his plan. When God recreates us for our new life in Christ, He doesn't promise that everything will be calm and peaceful in our lives. There's no guarantee that he makes to us as his followers of a trouble-free life. God doesn't promise Christians a life without problems, without suffering. As a matter of fact, he tells us that being a Christian, that being his follower, might in fact uh, present us with a, a special set of problems that can weigh very heavy upon us throughout our lives as we follow him. God promises 
promises us that we will not be crushed under that cross as we follow him. Yes, we may have doubts, but we will never be in utter hopelessness and despair by his grace and mercy. I'm sure that all of us have had doubts and questions about matters of faith, about the teachings of God and the Bible, about how we are to, to live out those truths of God's will and his word in our lives. And in spite of those questions, in spite of our struggles, we don't give up. The promises of God to us are sure and certain, and his promises will become clear that he will never leave us or forsake us. We will never be without a friend, without our God and Savior Jesus right there with us. He will make life worth living in spite of whatever challenges we might face. In verse 10, the Apostle Paul reminds us that we always carry around in our body the death of the Lord Jesus. But the victorious message, the wonderful message for us is that just as Christ was made alive, we also have a new life of faith in him. And that new life that we have in Jesus begins right now. In fact, it already has begun in our lives the moment that the Holy Spirit came into our hearts, whether at our baptism or whether the first time that we, we heard and believed the truth of God's forgiveness for us through Jesus. And that really is the whole purpose and function of the church, of, of believers gathered together around the mission that God has given to us. To lead people into this new relationship with God through faith in Jesus our Savior. We can take comfort, great comfort in the fact of our redemption. But we don't rest there. We don't stop there. We are redeemed people. People who have been bought back from slavery to sin and death by the blood of Jesus our Savior. We've been entrusted with a mission. We are on a mission from God to live and proclaim the love of Jesus for all people. We cannot simply just sit back and listen to the word of God, as important as that is, but he tells us we must also carry it out, live according to his word, carry out the mission that he has given to us. Some people want to hear that Jesus died for them, but there's more to the message than just that message. Yes, he loves you. He saved you. He has redeemed you. He has redeemed you for a reason and a purpose. He loves you so that your life will change by his power and his Holy Spirit working in your heart. God has given us power through his Spirit to overcome the world and its temptations and to live for him. And although, as, as the Apostle Paul says, we have the marks of death, Although we are mortal because of our sinfulness, yet he has called us to a life of victory. God wants you to begin that life right now. How can we be so privileged? How can this blessing come to us when we have so often interfered with God's plans by our own selfish sinfulness? So often I speak when I should be listening, or I listen when I should be speaking the truth of God's word. In spite of myself, in spite of my, my sins and my human frailty and weakness, God can use me and he does. He accomplishes also the same thing with your life. God can use you and he does. Just like a, a lump of clay in the potter's hands, God is constantly reminding us of who we are. Through our sins and through his righteousness. Through our death and the life that he gives. Through our problems and the solution that he offers. He reminds us who we are. And what the divine mission is for people like us who will always be human and, and imperfect, but empowered by his spirit. And so the divine potter shapes the clay and he molds it and, and he makes us into something useful to him for his purpose. A, a clay pot may be almost worthless by itself without any particular usefulness. Especially we, we think as, as we are simply a, a, a fragile clay vessel of the words 
that are so often spoken at a committal ceremony. You are dust, and to dust you will return. But in spite of our, our own sinful frailty and imperfection, we can still be changed by the power of God's Spirit. God shapes and molds this lump of clay into something that is beautiful and useful in his sight and, and for his mission. So may God give us the power to carry out that mission that he has entrusted to us. Even though we are imperfect and fragile clay pots, but by his grace we contain a great treasure, the good news of salvation through Jesus. Let's go and share it with us.